Hello, and welcome back to the Interdrone Podcast, your 30,000-foot view of the commercial drone industry. My name is CJ Smith. It is Tuesday, November 10th. We are coming to you live today. I'm really excited to bring you guys another episode of the Interdrone Podcast live. It's just been a really cool format for us. We're able to answer questions um, from, from all the viewers. And um, we have a really awesome guest on that we're uh, excited to, to talk to today. So Brendan Groves, um, Head of Policy and Regulatory Affairs at Skydio. Um, he's an interdrone speaker. And, um, you know, Skydio, one of the leaders, if not the leader in autonomous drone solutions. Um, they've had a really big year and really excited to talk to him Um just about what's top of mind for the organization. Um, Like every episode, we'll talk about a couple articles from the past week, and um, then we'll jump into an interview with Brendan. And um, please ask us questions. Um, If you're tuning in on Twitch, um, there's a box down below. You can uh, ask questions, get those answered. YouTube or Facebook, please leave a comment. Those will be routed to us, and uh, and we'll get your questions answered as well. So um, like I mentioned, coming to you live, um, co-host today, Michael Peel, Interdrone Chairman. And like I mentioned, Brendan Groves here with Skydio. So, Brendan, thanks uh, so much for for being here. Thanks so much for taking the, the leap of faith and joining us live today. Thank you, longtime listener. Glad to be uh, on the podcast thanks. today. Great, great, awesome. Um, maybe could you just give a brief, uh, brief background of your um, experience in in drones and, and aviation, and talk a little bit about your role at Skydio um, for anybody that's not not already familiar. Sure, happy to. So, like many people in the industry, I've always had my heads in the clouds. I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, which is the self-styled air capital of the world and was exposed to aviation at a young age. Got my pilot's license in high school 20 plus years ago now um, and have been in the ecosystem since then. So I started out as an Air Force officer where I worked on remotely piloted aircraft, both in the U.S. and actually in Afghanistan and the Middle East. Um, Spent time in the intelligence community and then before I joined Skydio, I spent four years at the U.S. Department of Justice as the Associate Deputy Attorney General for National Security. And that role, I had the good fortune to develop, lead, and scale DOJ's public safety drone program, which is now one of the largest in the country and the largest in the world, and also serve on the FAA Executive Committee, it's called. And this is the, the senior body that helps to chart the course for the integration of drones into the national airspace across the country. And and that was just a wonderful opportunity. Couldn't resist though the opportunity to jump into the team at Skydio, which are really on the new frontiers of autonomous flight. And so Skydio is the the largest, the leading US drone manufacturer. And we think the world leader in autonomous flight, our founders met as grad students at MIT more than a decade ago, and it was there that they pioneered the fundamental technology, both computer vision and deep neural networks, AI, that allow drones to fly themselves with the skills of an expert pilot. Uh, So that's the technology that we capitalize on at Skydio, and we're really excited to offer this, this new capability, not only to consumers, but to enterprise operators in the U.S. and increasingly around the world. So uh, thanks, Brendan. I'm really excited to kind of jump in with you on your DOJ J work and see yeah. how that's kind of informed where you are now, because we kind of need that, uh, you know, the, the government to private sector kind of uh, communication. So thank you for joining the dark side, because I think it actually helps. <laughs> um, I want to say hello to we've got a friend from Colombia who just said hi in the chat. So thank you for joining us live and uh, be sure to ask uh, Brendan your questions later or ask him now and we'll ask him on your behalf later. Yeah, Brendan, can you talk a little bit about that DOJ experience? I think um, that's just a really interesting combination of, of experience, traditional aviation, DOJ, and then now, you know, right, right smack dab in the middle with, with yeah. drones and UAS. No, it's kind of, uh, it's either weird or eclectic, um, but I, I draw on all those strands in every day at Skydio. And so I've been fortunate to be at the intersection of technology policy, national security, and regulation mm-hmm. for some time throughout my entire career. And, and I really do lean on every area of that background every single day at, at Skydio. So at, at Justice, it was interesting when I initially took the drone portfolio, there wasn't much of one. Uh, we had a handful of drones 
in the FBI. But that was about it. We, we, we weren't really using them in a transformative way across the enterprise. You know, DOJ, you don't hear about it much, but it's, it's an agency with a $28 billion budget, 115,000 personnel in about 100 countries um, across the world, not just the United States. Um, we have five components. The FBI is only one of them. The Bureau of Prisons, it's a $10 billion budget, ATF, DEA, the U.S. Marshals, and the like. I um, mean, we just weren't using drones. And I think what was stunning for me is that not long before joining Justice, less than a year, I returned from Afghanistan from a deployment with Joint Special Operations Forces. And I didn't have a desk job. Um, I was was I was at a desk part of the time, but I was also outside the wire, meeting with my Afghan counterparts, working on security-related measures. And when you go outside the wire, you generally are fortunate as a member of uh, the U.S. military to have eyes in the sky in some form, either a manned asset or an unmanned asset that can tell you sometimes, at least, what's around the corner. And what's around the corner is a really, really important thing to know when you're in a war zone. Uh, and the irony was not lost on me that the 25-year-old FBI special agents, we were asking to go around the corner to hunt a really dangerous federal fugitive, had no eyes in the sky of any kind. Uh, neither did the U.S. Marshals, which have, have one of the highest mortality rates, unfortunately, of any law enforcement agency because of the dangerous fugitive apprehension work that they do all over this country. Um, and I remember a senior U.S. Marshal telling me once after we had discussed how drones might be valuable there, if we had had this, my friend would still be here today. And he was talking about a friend, a Marshal who was killed by a suspect that popped out behind a wall, fired a shot, killing him instantly. If they had had some form of eyes in the sky, a small drone could have spotted that suspect and completely change the day and save that mm -hmm. individual's life. And that story is multiplied a thousand times over. So that was really the impetus for trying to expand DOJ's drone program and, and give federal officials the ability to have some form of comfort and situational awareness when they're doing extremely dangerous jobs um, all throughout the country, but do it in a way that protects privacy and civil liberties. That was our number one job when we were expanding DOJ's program. I mean, it's it's the type of technology that once you have it, it's hard to imagine the world before it, right? Like, I think, uh, you know, our kids will look back and like kind of wonder, like, how did how did you do that? Um, the same way that we kind of wonder, how did you communicate before the phone, right? And some, right. uh, you know, I've, I was around when there were beepers, you know, and, and pagers to get a hold of your parents and friends. Um, You're but, old. Yeah, yeah, I'm old, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's, I, and, and then in cases when you're talking about literal loss of life, I mean, it's, we're just not going to be able to, to tolerate that a life would even be lost in that situation in the future due to this technology. Yeah, I think that's right. And again, I mean, couldn't be more critical to front load the protection of privacy and several other reasons, everything we do in the drone space. Skydio has been a real leader. I'm not happy to talk through some of the policy and ethical measures that we've put out, some of which with partners, to ensure that we're promoting responsible use. We don't just sit in Silicon Valley and build stuff. Um, we actually think about how will this affect communities? How will it affect countries? How can we protect the rights that we cherish too? So um, that's really important, we think, is for technology creators, not just to sit on the sidelines smugly and watch things happen, but to be on the field, taking a position and helping to shape not only the technology that transforms society, but the rules and policies that govern the use of that technology. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is great to hear, uh, you know, Education is so important for the industry, whether that's educating the industry players or, or the public for public acceptance. And um, <clears throat> that's actually an article that we will be talking about um, a little bit later on. So stay tuned for that. Um, I do want to jump into the first article on our list, though. So um, 
some big news. I know Brendan, you know, I even shot a couple of emails about this um, earlier this year, but uh, Skydio um, get, receiving a waiver with the North, uh, North, sorry, North Carolina Department of Transportation for BV loss bridge inspections. Um, so like the article says, this marks the first time a state transportation agency has been granted FAA approval for such a waiver. Um, and I, I do think it was really impressive that the waiver was done um, in, in kind of in partnership with Skydio and, and the um, North Carolina Department of Transportation. As many of us know, North Carolina DOT um, was one of the, um, the sites for the IPP program. Um, so, but it's, it was great to see them, you know, taking the kind of the leader here. Um, Brendan, what can you talk, to, um, tell us about the, the waiver process and um, maybe just talk to us why it is so so unique and and kind of innovative right thanks cj so let me step back and the north carolina waiver is part of a larger story and that story is the way that we're approaching not only technology based around autonomy but also the regulatory system so we're not just the technology vendor we again we don't just sit there and make autonomous drones we're actually on the field with customers um, ensuring that they're able to use them the way they're intended to be used with minimal friction. And that's exactly what we did here. And our overall regulatory approach is somewhat different than you've seen before, which I think is why we're having some success. You know, again, this is a great credit to the FAA too, but we are laser focused on unlocking the airspace from the ground up. And I mean that in the most literal sense imaginable. Imagine it, every work site or every bridge along every highway and every electrical substation, being able to fly beyond visual line of sight at low altitude first, mask or in the vicinity of both structures and terrain where you present almost no risk to manned aircraft unless the manned pilot is drunk and extraordinarily high levels of value to the operator who's conducting the mission and the asset owner. That's our approach. You know, traditionally the industry has spent a lot of money and a lot of years trying to fly as high and as far as they possibly can. That's great. We love that. It's important. But when you talk to a regulator, their heads explode. The higher you want to fly, the farther you want to go. When you talk to the regulator and say, I just need to fly below this 200 foot tall light pole in a rail yard to conduct real time inspection of multi billion dollar assets that determine whether or not you get your next Amazon package, then you can have a conversation. And then the regulator is willing to step forward and maybe break some rules that have applied in the past. So that's the approach we've taken at Skydio. And when I joined the company in January, we settled on a two-pronged approach and I'll make this quick. The first was we wanna work with a public sector operator who has a little more latitude under part 91 to accept ground risk. Um, to mission. No more latitude to accept risks to manned aircraft, but a little more latitude and ground risk. That's exactly what we did. So the Chula Vista Police Department, big partner of ours, we worked with them to secure the first ever tactical beyond visual line of sight waiver that allows public safety officers to fly within 1,500 feet beyond visual line of sight, within 50 feet of structures of the ground with no visual observer at all and no requirement to leverage radar or other extremely expensive and unnecessary means of detecting and avoiding manned aircraft, which you shouldn't encounter at that kind of low altitude. As you, as you remember, a month after we got that waiver, the FAA did something they've never done before. They enabled every single public safety agency in the country to do the same thing without a waiver. It's almost regulation by rule rather than waiver. You send the FAA an email with a form uh, CONOP and you'll get the same authority that we spent six months working on the safety case with Chula Vista. So then we pivoted into part two of the strategy, which was let's use that victory to achieve a big breakthrough for our part 107 partners and customers. That's what we do with North Carolina DOT. And the waiver quickly broke through a couple of barriers. And one, if you want to do these close in inspection operations, you've had a technological barrier. All drones in the market, have traditionally required GPS. All drones in the market have traditionally been subject to electromagnetic interference, and they have also required highly expert pilots, especially to fly really low. There's also a significant regulatory barrier. Good luck inspecting a bridge without needing to fly beyond visual line of sight. People do it, but it takes two to five times longer than it should 
because the operator has to reposition herself every 10 or 15 minutes to maintain visual line of sight. That doesn't make sense. We're living in the 21st century. The drone should do the hard work. That's what we believe at Scuddy. And that's what we did with our partners and friends at North Carolina DOT, where we worked with them to get a breakthrough waiver that has three features that are totally new in the industry. One is the waiver allows beyond visual line of sight flights with no visual observers. You really haven't seen that before. Um, second, it doesn't require radar or other forms of, of expensive and in this case unnecessary detect and avoid. And third, it's not site specific. So the North Carolina DOT pilot, when he or she shows up to a site, can run through a set of performance-based criteria. And if those criteria are met, that pilot can initiate beyond visual line of sight flights without phoning home to the FAA. The pilot can be a pilot and do what I do in a manned aircraft um, and decide what is appropriate in a given context. That is something that is breakthrough, right? Um, these barriers have tied the hands of commercial operators and no longer. And I want to give a shout out, of course, to North Carolina, but also to the FAA. They knew that granting this waiver would open up a deluge of interest across the commercial space in doing the same thing in a variety of other sites. And it absolutely has. So again, I just want to give credit to the FAA for ultimately approving this waiver, um, knowing though that it would give folks the, the, the muscle memory and the power to try and apply it to other settings. So I'm gonna to try to make my comments punctuated because the landscaper for my neighbor is <laughs> next door. But um, so it's to your point on the FAA there. So it, is it just because you're Scadio and you're well known that you're able to kind of make that connection with them and get stuff done? Is it more about actually just being able to speak their language or, or, or and knowing who to contact? Like what is the kind of genesis of uh, of the process, when do you know you're going to the FAA with your questions? And when do you know that those questions are actually gonna yield results, not only for you, but for broad, uh, a more broader sense for the industry? Right, a couple of answers. So this wasn't the, the product of some kind of inside baseball relationship with the FAA, right? I think there were two factors here that augured in our favor. One was we have an autonomous platform that doesn't need GPS. It's not subject to electromagnetic interference. It can fly under a bridge comfortably, competently, completely safely. Uh, you just haven't really seen that in the marketplace. So that breeds confidence to a regulator that this drone isn't gonna crash into stuff. They care about that as you, as you well know. And the second thing is we took a different approach. So we constructed a safety case based on both domestic precedents and international precedents. And when I say domestic precedents, I mean academic precedents. So the MIT Lincoln Lab has done some great work on the level of risk associated with low altitude flights for airspace risk and concluded that it really presents fundamentally extremely limited to no risk, depending on where you are, how close you are to a structure. We brought all of that academic literature to bear as well as emerging consensus from the rest of the world that low altitude flights present little to no risk to manned aircraft. And so we leveraged all of that in the safety case. I think that's something that the FAA hadn't really seen before, um, all in, in one part. And, and maybe the third factor is we were members, we are members of the North Carolina Integration Pilot Program, now part of the BEYOND program, which was just announced, I think a week or two ago. So that does let you work a little more closely with the FAA. But again, I think it all comes down to autonomy and to strategically constructing a safety case. One thing that was really interesting, and thanks for breaking that down for us, because there is so much more to it than I think, um, you know, the, we, may, we may have we may have realized. Um, you mentioned though that when the DOT, North Carolina DOT, that pilot, um, when they are also all of a sudden certified, and you said they could go to a new site and essentially perform a similar mission, uh, and there's a list of ch uh, like a checklist that they need to follow. Who is, is that an FAA checklist that they want to see this pilot complete at, at every deployment at a new site? Or is that something that you guys at Skydio are kind of employing? So we, we wrote the checklist with North Carolina DOT okay. and presented it to the FAA as what we want to do is, is change the paradigm, right? Traditionally, you get a BV loss waiver. By the way, the FAA has only granted 65 
hmm. or so beyond visual line of sight waivers in the last four it's years. Higher than I thought, to be honest. Yeah. Out of out of three thousand ish applications. So okay. think about yeah. that for a second. And all of those are most of those, not all of them, are limited to a specific side or a handful. And and that is a great way to ensure the industry never scales. Right. <laughs> so what we want to do is flip the script and say, no, 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 no. And when the government regulates, both Republicans and Democrats always agree that regulation should be performance based. So you and I, as the regulated entities, we get to say, tell the government, we meet your performance based rule for X. Why don't Part 107 waivers work the same way? Right. Not rocket science. Um, and so the criteria that we built is framed around that that you know, non-controversial concept, which is if we're in uncontrolled airspace, if I'm this close to the bridge, if I'm at this altitude, I should be able to fly beyond visual line of sight. And I don't have to ask FAA headquarters in DC. Now there are some reporting requirements in the back end, but they're not ex ante. They're not pre-approval requirements. And North Carolina has 13,500 bridges. It would be impracticable for them to tell the FAA or get permission before they fly a single bridge. And what's spectacular about this new ability for our friends at North Carolina is, and I wish I was one of their bridge inspectors talking to you because they're really the ones who are most excited. And as North Carolina has said in public in the press release after it, what this means for a bridge inspector is that they now no longer have to repel, literally repel with ropes over the side of bridges that are sometimes hundreds of feet above a ravine or be positioned in the bucket of a snooper truck below a bridge to do a manual inspection, this is a completely different world for them where they can stand on the bridge deck, fly beyond visual line of sight below it, get high fidelity images, go where they couldn't go if they were repelling it, and then go do another bridge that same day instead of having to be at a single site for 10 hours to shut down traffic. So both for the bridge inspectors, for DOT, and for society, you know, we've really entered a new world, and this waiver, I think, is indicative of that. I find it so interesting because some of the time, it's not even the the impasse is not even the regulator being able to work uh, with you, or or even um, just other stakeholders that might be afraid to integrate a drone. It's it's actually sometimes like just not even being able to imagine that it could scale at that level so safely. Right. If you dot the I's, cross the T's, put the work in. Uh, and I think that's kind of one of the advantages. Um, and, you know, we we've personally talked about the issues of the Silicon Valley kind of venture capital model, sometimes hurting things in, in aerospace because it just doesn't get it. But one of the clear advantages of kind of the mentality is the understanding uh, of software automation and how when you set these things up correctly, they actually are more efficient and safer than what a human being can produce uh, it, with regularity. Right. Yeah. And, and so, so Scottio, before I joined even, the CEO, Adam, Adam, Adam Bree, has taken a different approach. You know, many people in the industry and many companies based in Silicon Valley cast some level of aspersions on the FAA. They blame the FAA for slowing down the growth of the industry, for refusing to let the industry scale. Scadio has never done that. Um, we think that the level of technology is also uh, partly to blame, maybe even mostly to blame. You couldn't even do this inspection with a drone that needed GPS or was subject to electromagnetic interference. So once technology improves, you're gonna see progressive changes and improvements in regulation to respond with it. I think it's really exciting how scalable this can be for for um, for the state of North Carolina, for the DOT there. And then do you, do you think this is something that other states can start to employ and, and kind of take this model that North Carolina is using and and um, you know start to start to do something like that themselves? It, it absolutely is. And it's not limited to other state departments of transportation. Again, the the basic concept that underlies a waiver is twofold. One is the idea of infrastructure masking. So the lower the altitude, the closer to obstacles, the lower level of risk. And the second fundamental concept is performance-based criteria to fly beyond visual line of sight. Mm -hmm. So if you take those two ingredients, you bake a regulatory cake, you can do lots of things uh, with that. Now, of course, the FAA is the ultimate arbiter 
of approval. Um, but I think they wouldn't have granted the waiver in North Carolina DOT unless they agreed with the principle of infrastructure masking and unless they agreed, at least in the right circumstances, in the principle of performance-based BV loss waivers. Again, two, two things we just haven't seen until now. I want to yeah. give a shout out to our friend Scott from First Size. He's in the chat right now. Um, so he's got a question. Do you see a place for pilot ratings in SUS? around situational operation types, platform risk levels, or otherwise? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I think uh, autonomy somewhat obviates that um, because the, the platform can conduct meaningful operations with the oversight of a Part 107 pilot. But the Part 107 pilot, as maybe we'll talk about later today, can just do a lot more jobs in less time completely safely with an autonomous platform. And that's one of the features of the North Carolina waivers that the drone can also fly itself comfortably even in GPS denied settings. And so what that allows is it makes the pilot and her boss sleep better at night when they're confident that the drone isn't going to careen into the bridge truss and crash down on anything below it. So I do think there might be a place for pilot ratings. And obviously the FAA is interested in, in type certification you know, but we, we think autonomy has a role to play there. Um, and maybe we'll talk more about how some of our other software products are revolutionizing uh, the role that the Part 107 pilots can play, not replacing them by any stretch, but actually making them better, making them a lot more money because they can do more jobs in, in less time. Thanks for answering Scott's question. He's uh, We've only had two, but he could be considered a regular already. Um, <laughs> So thanks again, Scott, for asking. Um, CJ, do we have another article to hit up? Yeah, we sure do. And um, like Mike mentioned, um, please, if you are listening, feel free to ask a question. Um, we'll definitely um, try to answer them um, either right away or uh, depending on when they fit in or what we're discussing maybe a few minutes later, but we will get them answered. Um, so the second article I want to talk about um, talks about kind of drone awareness in, in the public eye. So um, the, an EU funded project um, called Respond Drone is working on providing critical information and communication services for first responders. And they held a focus groups in six different European countries. Um, the article says that the focus groups revealed the, that most participants associated drones with amateur photography and videography, children's toys and military operations, or they, very, they knew very little about drones. Um, comments on the acceptance of the operation of drones were split between negative feedback, mainly due to privacy and noise concerns and the understanding of the potential improvements it could offer to emergency responders to a lesser extent. Um, so we talked about this a little bit at the beginning of the podcast. I mean, Brendan, you even mentioned that, um, you know, having an asset in the sky, um, you, you know, you, you mentioned using them in, in, in military areas, but it's, it's potentially life-saving. And I think, um, you know, you see the comments that come in from these focus groups. And I think we're no stranger to that either being in the industry. Um, but public perception is just so important. And, um, you know, you, you guys mentioned that you're out there kind of boots on the ground, trying to push forward legis legislation, trying to educate the public, trying to create transparency. Um, but, you know, any insight onto just kind of where you see public perception and public acceptance, um, you know, in the United States and hear from the public and then, and then you know, what, what else is Scadio doing to try to help combat some of those, those, um, those fears? Yeah, thanks, CJ. I don't think we could spend enough time on this question, but I'll try and keep my answer brief. So I don't think this fascinating survey in Europe shows that drones aren't useful for first responders. We know that's not the case. Right. Drones are profoundly useful for first responders. What it shows is that the industry is still very, very early. Drones are phenomenally powerful tools, but we are just getting started. You know, people, I think, assume that the industry is much more mature and much more well-developed than it actually is. We are at the beginning lap, the first mile of the industry, and that survey, I think, proves it. In terms of what matters for public acceptance and what we can all do collectively, and this is a team sport building public acceptance, I think a couple of factors. I mean, one, the public has to see the value that drones provide with their own eyes. We, we recently announced, I think last month, 
Um, it's been a busy month. Scadio House Scan. This is the largest commercial drone deal in history. Um, most observers believe it's a partnership between Scadio and Eagleview. Eagleview being the largest provider of aerial imagery to insurance companies here and around the world that allows Scadio drones with special software we developed in house to autonomously inspect residential roofs. That is happening at scale across the United States. Uh, it's coming to a home near you, possibly even your home, if God forbid um, something happens to it after a disaster or incident. And it allows just literally one push of a button, inspection, 3D mapping, photogrammetry, completely autonomously with the drone. Um, but it's also creating thousands of jobs because there'll be part 107 pilots that will do this and do tons of jobs because it's happening um, automated. So when people see that on their house, on their roof, they immediately get the value of drones because before they would have paid, their insurance company would have paid someone to fly a giant drone that's incredibly noisy, incredibly loud, way above your house, fly over your whole neighborhood, um, or they would have hired a made aircraft, not good for the environment, some danger associated with that, and it's extremely expensive. And now they can watch with their own eyes as an autonomous drone safely and effectively inspects your roof, 3D maps it, you get your, your, your quote um, for the damages in much less time than you would otherwise. So that's maybe part one. And part two is we as an industry need to promote norms of responsible use. And we talked about this a little bit. Again, so Skydio is, we want to be a leader in this. We're not on the sidelines, we're on the field in shaping responsible use. We released earlier this summer, the Skydio engagement and responsible use principles. First drone company anywhere in the world, we think, to have articulated our policy and ethical vision of our products and this technology as a whole. And those, those principles say that in the context of every deal, every new product, we think not just about the value, but we think how will this product or software affect our communities? How will it affect countries as a whole? We also think about responsible artificial intelligence and, and promoting best practices. The better we do on that, the more trust there'll be. We also worked with, going back to the public safety theme quickly, we also worked with drone responders, the largest association dedicated to the use of drones by first responders, to issue a first of a kind document earlier this summer called the five C's. You may have heard about it and read it the principles and the responsible use of drones by public safety agencies. Um, and that is a groundbreaking document that is now starting to be in use with public safety agencies across. Yeah, the finally bringing some uniformity to the thought there. Uh, drone responders has been trying to do a lot of work and it's 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 a lot of work to, to establish standards, right? And, and right. work with as many agencies as there are with their different practices to create them. So cheers to them and all the people there that helped uh, create that 5C document. Yeah, and so we, that was a partnership between Skydio and drone responders. And again, want to give them a lot of credit for leaning forward. And the third ingredient finally is, is I think part of the reason the public doesn't necessarily trust drones is that drones have been known to crash, right? Manually flown drones are not that hard to crash and autonomy helps to build public trust because autonomous drones are just less likely to crash. Um, and that's a part of building public trust. Autonomy helps to build that foundation of, uh, of trust in the public. So uh, we one, have, oh, you want to, you want to go CJ? Well, yeah, just real quick. I think one point you made, um, you know, once the public see, if they see a drone, um, you know, whether it's inspecting their house or whether, you know, they can see an example of it being used and, and maybe potentially saving a life that, you know, the learning curve or the um, kind of acceptance curve is just accelerated so much quicker. And we had uh, Scott Malakar on, he, um, 33 year fire service veteran. And we were talking to him about getting um, funding, right? How he's kind of pitching his, his drone program to, um, you know, the uh, government boards and, and the government funding boards. And he says that once he was able to show them a live video um, or a live stream of what that drone was doing and either take like, um, you know, take uh, like an infrared video through smoke or whether it was, you know, like a night flight and show something. I mean, once he was able to do that, he said that it was just made, his life so much easier and they were they were granting funding to him almost you know whenever he he came with a, a reason for it and um i think that was just really cool to hear so i i think to your point um you know we just need to get these examples these case studies these use cases out there um and and, and he says uh you know a picture tells a thousand words he said a video to him is worth a thousand dollars or maybe more in some cases 
Right. So uh, I just want to say hi to Richard Lopez, who's on our advisory board. Uh, he just made a statement to, that he's looking forward to seeing Skydio's uh, unit perform in a construction area. So not to put you on the spot to speak for the entirety of Skydio because you're you're the policy guy, but uh, it seems like your knowledge uh, of of your own organization is pretty wide. So is there, you know, what's Skydio thinking in terms of the construction industry? How does uh, kind of your insight there, and, and, and we're talking about job sites, so safety is, is primary. Uh, what's kind of the role of autonomy, and how does that sometimes actually kind of get in the way of user control? Like, is there a need for that in, in a construction environment more so than there might be in, let's say, a bridge inspection environment? Yeah, no, it's a great question, and hello to Richard as well, who's obviously a real industry leader for a really long time. So, you know, we think autonomy makes all the difference in the world in the construction context. And we don't just think about that. We've seen it in practice with our, our customers and in related industries, you know, the railroads, um, things like that. But on, on job sites, there's a lot of stuff in a small place and you can't afford to damage any of it. Um, safety has to be number one. And that's not just a saying, it's a, it's, it's, it's a way of living. Um, and so we've we've had just great traction across that that space in, in some other companies, um, one of whom, and I probably can't say which, but there's a there's one drone service provider that is changing their their logo, which right now has a picture of another company's drone, and it will soon be a logo based on the Skydio too, because of their use of our products in construction job sites across the country. So just for one example, and the reason is is because autonomy does make the difference. You know, they, they work on sites that have very large cranes that move around. And when you're flying autonomous drone, the operator conducting the mission just doesn't have to worry about impacting a crane that might be in a different position today than it was yesterday, for instance, or other assets that move around. And the other thing that we're seeing very quickly is, is what, you know, a lot of people are using drones for mostly in these sites is, is, is uh, photogrammetry and, and capture and mapping really important for any number of engineering and environmental compliance reasons. We are releasing in short order a product called 3D Scan. And this is basically the derivative of, of house scan that allows you to autonomously inspect and capture and map any asset without any prior knowledge of it or any human intervention. You just take off the drone, select the asset, and the drone goes to town, does all the work, and does Olympic style flying in and around the asset to produce a spectacular map in real time before your very eyes, um, doing something that would have taken you hours to do, you can now do in minutes. Um, and, and you can do a lot of it in a day, not just one or two assets. So that kind of capability, uh, which we'll be releasing a bit down the road here after we already released HowScan, is going to transform the way that people use drones on construction sites and in other types of infrastructure inspection operations so, so thank you for for that response and thank you for answering richard's question we're going to take a short break to talk about our platform launchpad uh which is a new resource for the commercial drone industry so uh let's cut to the ad i don't want to take you away from the podcast for too long but i got to catch you up to speed on what intro drone's been doing over the last couple months we've created this awesome new resource called launchpad which includes all of our previously recorded session content, every webinar we've had with a thought leader, and even past episodes of this podcast. On top of that, it includes an index of every person who's ever spoken at Interdrone and every company that's relevant to the drone space. The best part is all that information interlinks so you can find the tools and resources you need to advance your drone program. Memberships start for free on Launchpad. All you have to do is go to launchpad.arrow and sign up today. Okay, and we're back. Uh, I just want to make a point that uh, Richard Lopez's video was not planned. <laughs> that ad was pre-recorded. <laughs> I wanted to say something like that too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it couldn't have worked out any better. Um, 
But yeah, definitely go check out Launchpad. We're really excited um, to, to bring it to you guys. It's got all of our recorded session content. Um, it's got all of our webinars. It's got this podcast. We have the Drone Professional Index and the Drone Company Index, with which breaks out different vendors by product category, by by industry, and, and much more. So definitely head over there, create your account for free today, launchpad.aero. Um, we'll put this, the link in the description of this podcast. You can also see that link rotating on a banner in the bottom right corner of this podcast. And in addition to that banner, you'll see a link to register for a upcoming webinar. We have a Skydio. So um, Brendan uh, will be taking next week off um, from us, but we have three of his colleagues that uh, we'll be hosting next Thursday. So um, we'll put that link in the description. If you're just listening, if you are watching, you can see the link um, in the bottom right quadrant of, of that banner. So <clears throat> um, Brendan, I want to talk to you a little bit more about just autonomous drones. Um, you know, are there other companies working on autonomous drones? Um, you know, I think it, autonomous drones, at least to me, is almost synonymous with Skydio. But um, can you talk about maybe the the competitive landscape for autonomy in drones in UAS? And then um, what regulatory challenges either um, are, are new with autonomous drones that you guys have to deal with? Or are there even regulatory challenges that maybe you don't have to deal with as much um, compared to a piloted drone or piloted aircraft? Yeah, so autonomy has long been the buzzword in the industry, right? Everybody seems to say they have an autonomous solution. A lot of that I like to say is photonomy. Uh, it's not for real. If you if you look into it, the drones might have autopilot obstacle avoidance and some autopilot stuff. You know, good for you, but that's just flying a script. So if there is an asset in the way, or if you're flying sideways, you know, good luck. All bets are off. Um, and that's why, you know, right now about 60% of enterprise operators say their number one fear, their number one risk is crashing mm -hmm. because it happens and it's not a good day for the part 107 pilot whose who's fault. It's really often not their fault. I mean, it's the fact that we should trust technology, be able to trust technology more than we can. And that's what Skydio intends to do is provide trusted technology that lets you be more effective at whatever it is um, you're doing. So there are, you know, everybody says they have autonomy um, in some level, but, you know, Skydio, this is our bread and butter. We've been doing it our, since the founders days at MIT about 12 years ago. Um, so, and we've been building on that ever since. So it's, it's kind of hard to catch up with that level of, of internal expertise. And we've been waiting, of course, for the right time to really turn the dial up and, and release our products in the world, which really started last year. And quickly in terms of how autonomy affects the regulatory calculus, we mainly see opportunities, not obstacles. I mean, again, very briefly, one, part 107 allows autonomous operations right now. You don't have to buy it from me, it says that. Um, as long as the pilot maintains the ability to direct the drone, you can conduct autonomous operations. That's why you can conduct your lawnmower power and sort of dumb autonomous, photonomous missions um, right now. And Skydio makes that even easier because when you're flying a Skydio, we don't need GPS, we don't are not subject to EMI. You retain control as the pilot, even when your drone is flying completely, you know, inside the truss of a bridge, let's say, or around a construction crane, or right up through the middle of a high voltage transmission tower, something you'd never even dream of doing with other products on the market. Not only can you do that, but you'll have full control. So the drone can do itself, but you can intervene at any time and take control, even in those types of really difficult environments. And so that's some of the, the value we see. And I think, again, ultimately, at the end of the day, it all comes down to trust. Do you trust this device to perform the task? The regulator has that same question. Can I trust this device to perform this task beyond visual line of sight in our case? And the answer has been, from the FAA now multiple times over, a resounding yes. I think that bodes really well, of course, for Skydio and all of our partners and customers, but for the industry as a whole. Again, the more we can trust the products, the better the regulatory system and the more flexibility uh, we'll have. So we got uh, two more questions that came in. Um, so one thing becoming popular is remote bases containing drones, but operated from a central location. Do you see this approach becoming a must for public safety and other first responders? In short, yes. Um, so we will be releasing, we have 
announced sort of in, in preview form that uh, we'll also be releasing what we call the Skydio doc, and we intend to democratize the doc. We think that the secret to doing a docked drone solution well is a drone that's capable of flying itself. That is really the difference, and that's one reason why you haven't necessarily seen docked concepts take off. But I think it's difficult to understate the importance of dock solutions for the industry going forward. Docks represent the future. The drone should have a place to live, a place to recharge, and to conduct autonomous missions. You know, we, we, we see when we look into the crystal ball in the not so distant future, both in the US and in our work with global regulators, we see drones becoming pieces of infrastructure as much or maybe even more than their aircraft, where low altitude, very small, lightweight drones performing high value operations in and around structures like substations and railroads and rail yards, performing those work and on the public safety side too, drones in a, in a, in a, in a fire truck, for instance, responding to the scene. It's impossible to understate the centrality of the dock to that future. So absolutely agree with the question. And there's a lot of people working on, on, um, on docks and, and we're definitely gonna be in the mix as well. So there's, there's one more question. Um, <clears throat> all of the industrial inspections we do require 40 plus MP megapixel full sensor cameras and LIDAR that weighs 12 plus pounds. Are you going to serve that market? So yeah, what types of payloads and, yeah. and weights can, can Scotty aircrafts? Yeah, so we've seen a lot of the, the requirements. The requirements in the market today are based on, I, I can't fly close to the asset, so I have to fly far away. And the further away you are, the, the, the more intense the camera that you may need. You know, at Skydio, again, we're sort of flipping the script. The same thing was true of residential roof inspection. So if you ask most people a year ago, they would say, oh, I need a giant camera. I might need LIDAR, I definitely need LIDAR to inspect a residential roof. They never would have dreamed of inspecting LIDAR in the case of the Skydio 2 with a 12 megapixel, uh, and, 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 and inspecting a roof rather with, in the case of the Skydio 2, a 12 megapixel EO camera flying in very close proximity to the roof, just two or three meters away. So there's been a lot of par like paradigm shifting that is happening right now and will happen in the future. Um, so when you have a drone like that, that can fly close and can 3D map autonomously an asset without human input by flying in and around the asset at very close range, it changes the kind of sensor you need. And you also don't need LIDAR because um, a Skydio 2 is a thousand dollar drone. We can conduct those same level of precise photogrammetry missions completely autonomously with a much cheaper sensor um, that has the same capability because we're flying really close. So again, I think there's a lot of these norms that, that we're seeing evolve, um, and especially with respect to camera size, distance from the asset and the like. You know, that's interesting because I remember when I first kind of joined this industry um, and the, the influence of LIDAR was, was much higher. And there were real, I think it was like 2016, I was already seeing real leaps and bounds into uh, analysis you could do with RGB imagery. Just the level of detail has been improving, RTK, uh, all those kind of other things um, running in tandem and parallel together, uh, just improving it. Um, and ultimately, it becomes like a cost function at some point, right? If you're able to do things cheaper uh, and more efficiently, sometimes actually 5% more degraded data is okay because you're able to produce more data and then get better insights via analysis. Um, so there's it's more of a statement on the, the chat right now, but I, I think it does bear uh, actually lifting it up because uh, I've seen the confluence. I mean, even the word drone itself, right? Uh, if you were to ask, especially people who came from the military side of things earlier in, the, in what would have been the commercial drone revolution, the use of the word drone was kind of faux pas. Um, so the statement is, I think autonomy needs defining better. Uh, there is, as Brendan mentions, phony autonomy. There's autonomy based on lots of visual and other inputs like Skydio. And then there's one, maybe two prototype drones flying autonomously using 
only inertial navigation. Uh, I mean, that's interesting to me. It would be helpful if the industry defines its own terms for clarity. I mean, are we ever going to win that battle, especially in the land of acronyms that is is drones? Or do we kind of just have to let uh, popular opinion ride and uh, let time figure it out? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's a great question. I, I You're right that there are, there are, on the march to autonomy, there are many roads, right? And so one thing we've seen is that what car company has arguably the most advanced autonomous solution in the market today? It's Tesla. Does Tesla use LiDAR? No, they don't. They use computer vision. Uh, it's no accident that they do that. It's a lot cheaper. It's, it's just as effective in many cases. That's not to say there's no path for LiDAR, but there are lots of ways to achieve autonomy. So having that gradually increasing level of standardization, not only in, in our vocabulary, but in practice, I think is helpful. And it's a great question. That's something that Skydio intends to be involved in. There are some standards bodies that are beginning to explore that just a little bit. So I would expect in the next year or two to see a lot of movement along those lines. But one question I'm really excited to ask you about is um, uh, blue UAS. Uh, you know, I, I, so obviously a huge topic this year, um, uh, poten potential DJI ban. It looks like now there is a DJI ban for at least for federal funds, but um, I believe it was the DIU picked five um, five different aircraft that it trusts and that um, it is kind of deeming blue UAS um, and, and, and trusted aircraft that that, that they um, allow government funds to be used on. Can, you know, you're the, like, like Mike mentioned, the policy guy. Um, can you talk to us maybe about that process and what that was like? Sure, yeah, Blue, Blue SUAS is a great program sponsored by the Defense Innovation Unit at the Pentagon that is focused on supporting the growth of a, of a healthy, strong, and sustainable domestic drone manufacturing base. And it's, it's no secret, nor is it a surprise that the program has really strong bipartisan support in the Congress. So Skydio is one of the five Blue SUAS drones and we're a trusted partner of not only the Department of Defense, but other federal agencies. And in terms of this, the selection process, there were really three core features. The first was performance evaluation along a number of, of levers, um, extremely rigorous, not just in a lab, but in the field for weeks, um, performance level evaluation. Two was cybersecurity evaluation. This is not just oh, let's run some superficial tests. And by the way, I worked at the National Security Agency and I teach cybersecurity law and policy to law school, as well as part of my background. This was a under the hood, uh, reverse engineer level cybersecurity mm -hmm. evaluation. And the third was supply chain security. It's sort of an underappreciated, but critically important aspect of cybersecurity is, where did your security critical parts come from? Um, and how do you think about that? So at the end of the day, Skydio was determined by the Department of Defense to be compliant with the really rigorous supply chain security restrictions that Congress levied on the Department of Defense in last year's National Defense Authorization Act, Section 848. And if you peel back a step further, I mean, the reason why we have a blue SUAS program is that the market just isn't terribly healthy right now. If you, you know, I guess putting Skydio aside, if you were a Martian and you dropped into this marketplace, you would wonder whether it were a good idea to have a single vendor dominate roughly 80% of the market, especially when that vendor is based in a country that may have interest adversarial to our own, especially when that vendor is required to comply with Chinese laws that allow access to data obtained by the company at any time, any place, anywhere, you would question why consumers don't have more choice. And you would probably conclude that more competition would be good for everyone across the board, manufacturers and consumers. And the Blue SUAS program is one part of that potential solution that ultimately helps to provide not only more choice for federal customers, but for every customer on the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the, uh, the need or interest is more federal though? Because you know, we've seen some surveys, even from first responders, where they're, they're not thinking in terms of Chinese security. Um, and then on, on that level, um, I mean, how much do they really need to be? And when do they need to be? Like, what is, 
what are the things they actually should be concerned about? Because I think that's also one of the things that kind of gets lost in the discussion here. What should they actually be looking to create a stopgap for? So even if they do choose to use a, a Chinese produced drone, even by an American company, right? So an American company where the manufacturing is done in China, what should they be looking out for? What they, should they be doing to actually secure that, that drone operation? Yeah, that's a good question. So on the public safety side, the most recent report that, that I've seen indicated that more than half of respondents, first responder agencies in the country were concerned about Chinese cybersecurity issues in some form or fashion. Some were very concerned and some were a little concerned, but more than half were thinking about this and wondering how to grapple with it. So this is a real issue in the first responder community. It's not exclusive to federal agencies. And we're also seeing it every single day on the enterprise side. In the US, we see it um, almost every day with major enterprise customers who are moving to secure solutions. Um, many of those, but not all of those secure solutions are, are products like ours that are made in the United States. We're also seeing that overseas as well. So the same trend is playing out. We now have an office in Japan for Asia Pacific. Yeah, did you see, so the Japanese government said they're not gonna be using Chinese drones. And it also happened on uh, within like a 24 hour span between Sony actually uh, announcing that they would be releasing a, a drone with some t AI component. Yeah, right. So, um, and we also have uh, a, a lot of business in, in the Japanese market. We love that, um, but you know, people, are, primarily buy our products because they fly themselves, they're autonomous, that makes you more effective and safe. Um, but cybersecurity is also an important ingredient um, in that. And, and people really are hungry for that. Again, not just government customers, but increasingly enterprise, increasingly first responders. And I think in terms of the risk to first responders, Major General Jim Poss, retired two-star general, you probably know him. In terms of the threat, and, and I wanna be a little cautious here, having spent a long time in the national security world, I'll sort of dance around some things, but he said that you know, first responders are excellent sources of information because they know what happens in a city. Um, and first responders, he said, are excellent sources of, of information in peace and intelligence in war. If you want to know what's going on, um, great to hack the military, maybe better to hack the local police department and fire department and EMS service because they really have the pulse of the city. And they also work with critical infrastructure. Um, providers all the time and responding to incidents. That's the kind of thing you want to know as a nation state um, and gathering intelligence long before the outbreak of any hostility. So in terms of the threat, I mean, the threat is obvious. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, again, the, the real threat actor here that everyone's concerned about, both Democrats and Republicans, enterprise and first responders is really the Chinese government. And these Chinese laws that demand data access. And it's no surprise that recently, I don't know if you saw this, a group of cyber experts assembled from Asia, Europe, and the United States under the auspices of CSIS, the, the leading US think tank not objective and nonpartisan, of course, released a really important set of digital trust standards. And it's no surprise that they concluded that political and governance factors matter a lot in assessing the trustworthiness of vendors for electronic and ILT devices. So, and what they say is where your vendor is headquartered has a lot to do with its trustworthiness. If the vendor is headquartered in a country with democratically elected governments that respect the rule of law, that vendor is likely to be more trustworthy because you're less worried, a lot less worried about the government forcing that vendor to create back doors into your products or to funnel information away. That, vis that risk is all too real with, with Chinese companies based in China that are obligated every day to comply with those requests. You know, there's an interesting kind of point there that I, now that I'm thinking back to, I, it was a terrorist incident in, I believe, Southern California. The iPhone and breaking into the iPhone was a question for for us yeah. right so i mean this this seems like it, it could go both ways because like i i would look at that and be like well i'm not sure i want the government to be able to crack in to that phone um 
you know, that there should be a certain base level of privacy that all users should be able to expect. So our Fourth Amendment uh, stay intact. And then also just my agreement with that uh, that phone manufacturer that, hey, I'm giving over all of my life to this thing. Maybe it should be more secure than a, a complete open door policy. And that ended up being resolved by the fact that uh, I believe our... NSA was able to crack into the phone anyway, or, or the FBI was able to crack into the phone anyway. So it got resolved not through even any legal action. So I, the issue is complex is really what I'm saying. And, and uh, you know, why does the country matter so much in this case, do you think? Especially, it's not just you saying this, this is outside security, security experts. Why does it matter so much? What are the factors there? Because it seems like the government uh, any reasonable government with power wanting to uh, have, you know, a certain level of safety could come up with a legitimate reason to want to crack into the devices. Yeah, the concern is entirely different. It couldn't be more different. And, and here's why, respectfully, Michael, what happened in San Bernardino was a federal prosecutor in the Obama administration approached a federal judge whose independent lifetime tenure owes allegiance to no one, presented facts and evidence based on the law. Apple had the opportunity to respond and contest that decision. That didn't happen in a back room. That didn't happen in a phone call. And if you recall, uh, Apple didn't actually have to do anything, take any action because they contested it. They have that right in the United States. Companies do not have that right in China. And don't take my word for it. Um, DJI and other companies have acknowledged, sometimes under oath, including DJI, their patent obligation to comply with that. There's not a give and take. There's no rule of law. There's no judicial system in which you are allowed under the 2017 National Intelligence Law in China to contest a decision that you must provide data. You provide the data. Uh, that is the reality in China. That yeah, is there's no even presumption not, of recourse is what exactly. you're basically saying. So, yeah. so again, I mean, that example actually proves the point perfectly. Apple had a free and open court system and they pursued uh, their way and they actually won at the end of the day. So, so I think the example really could not be more different. Well, I, you know, I had to take the opportunity because these are such serious questions and uh, it's rare that, you know, I, I have FaceTime with somebody is, uh, with your expert background to actually be able to answer it, right? And I think that's also goes back to kind of the, the public perception stuff that we were talking about um, before, whereas just, you know, access to information at this level about these things, I mean, there's a reason in some cases only experts are are looking at them and even they kind of disagree on the right answer even with all the information they can get right yeah i mean i, I don't know about that I, I think if you look at if you look at these provisions on the hill what's interesting is that you know they're like bipartisan members of congress driving some of these things and i i hate the term by the way people say oh this is like a dji ban i mean there's one proposal that's on the hill the american security drone act that that would prohibit federal agencies from buying drones made in China and actually drones with certain components made in China, some of which might be security critical. Um, obviously, Skydio's products comply with that, but that bill is not going to affect commercial use, um, is not going to affect consumer use. It's limited to federal agencies who care deeply about cybersecurity. And what's fascinating is that that bill has profound bipartisan support. So Vice President-elect Kamala Harris voted for that measure in March of this year in the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. And, you know, that's provision ultimately is based on facts and, and not fear. And I'll keep this short, but the Secretary of Interior released a ban of their own on buying Chinese made IoT devices, including drones, earlier this year. And the Secretary has made clear on the record that he took that decision based on sensitive national security information presented to him. And again, I, I don't want to confirm or corroborate that. I'm just happy to refer you to their statements. But you've heard various members of Congress say the exact same thing, including folks like Democrat Richard Blumenthal in Connecticut, who said these drones are, quote, Trojan horses. They send your data to China. Uh, he happens to be on the Armed Services Committee with access to information. 
So again, I mean, I think if you look at that, you start to say, gosh, there's a lot of smoke here. Looks like there's fire. And that's what we've heard from both sides of the aisle, not some sort of partisan effort by any particular group. Yeah, we had our um, program director, or I forget her official title, but she's working on our policy section for the show, uh, talk about the bipartisan support on on the security issues. Um, it seems that even outside of drones, that uh, data security issues with China, I know there's been some kind of play in the news that this was specific to the Trump administration. It is not uh, when you really look at the details. It seems to be a bipartisan kind of growing concern as we, you know, evolve into tech first humans. I mean, look at the environment we're in. We're we're all doing the Zoom call um, because we want to in this case, but we do probably hundreds of calls in a month that are just a matter of we have to now. Right. Um, right. And so our data security becomes kind of paramount to almost every conversation because it's the world we live in. Right. Yeah. And I think it ultimately it comes down to. For all the digital devices we use, not just speaking for drones, it comes down to the only way to trust a digital device is to trust the entity that developed it and the legal framework in which they operate. It's really that simple. If you can't answer that question in the affirmative, you might want to pick a different device. Absolutely. You know, and that, that's the thing. Your security is ultimately your responsibility if you're an enterprise user. So if you have concerns, uh, you know, it is your duty to actually look into uh, securing your data because that data is the value of your organization. And actually, data that leaks sometimes has negative value that outweighs its positive value in its collection. So uh, absolutely, uh, right. we, we've always supported education in that realm. So uh, kind of a lighter question, I think, to, to top things off. Uh, interested in a this is from UK Drone Man. Interested in layman's answer to how you cope with the massive variability of the real world with all the machine vision that you see. Is there, is this something that needs training on a particular situation like the bridge you mentioned, or is it something clever enough to be generally used? Uh, so what, what's the Scadio magic? Uh, can you just give us the code? Yeah, it's, it's an awesome question. It's an awesome question. Uh, and the answer is yes. The technology now is, is general. So we don't need specific training for a specific use case. What's, what's different is a lot of autonomous solutions, and I'll keep this short, they, allow, they, under, they see the world, but they don't understand it. In Skydio, it's different. So if you're flying the Skydio inside of a building and it sees a textualist surface like a wall, that's traditionally the death of autonomous systems because it's incredibly difficult to estimate depth perception and state estimation, which is the heart of everything we do. But the Skydio solution, because we've had 12 years, because our founders started at MIT, they've had 12 years to get it right. And so the Skydio camera system, which has six cameras that see in every direction in 4K color and fuses together a 3D map in real time. It's not like CGI added on after the fact. The drone, you can't shut that off. It's always flying itself and mapping the world around it. When it sees a wall, it knows that's a wall. I know that walls end. I don't know where it's gonna end, but I'm guessing that it probably ends somewhere in the future. I need to watch out for that. When you're flying next to a power line and a, 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 you know the poles that support the power lines, the Skydio 2 doesn't just say, oh gosh, that's some weird thing. I don't know what that is. It's, it, it's, it knows that that is a power line. Power lines almost always connect to other power lines. Therefore, I should be cautious in those coordinates coming up around this corner. So the Skydio 2 has the ability and the X2, our enterprise bigger brother, not only to see the world, but to understand it. That is actual autonomy as opposed to photonomy. Um, and that's based on deep neural networks that Skydio has, has patented and pioneered, again, over more than a decade. Um, so most of that training data we've collected ourselves, um, but there is a lot of training data, but it is able, it works so well that it's able to be applied in, in any use case without any sort of prior software work. Is there any like route uh, route to improvement though with uh, individual training, or is it the type of thing that uh, you kind of don't want to ruin the sauce with too much salt, or you know, like are you are you by adding uh, extra nuances, you actually make the general uh, algorithm weaker? Right, that's a great question. We're always improving the algorithm, always, 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 and we have we're fortunate to have a team of some of the best roboticists and autonomy engineers in the business. 
um, working at, at Skydio. So we're always improving the algorithm behind the scenes and you see some of this in updates. Um, we just allowed you know, case landing and, and a recent software update for everyone, consumers, enterprises, uh, really cool based on deep neural networks um, and also through a Q QR code that's on top of the case. So we're always, always, always fine tuning and improving the algorithm. And you see that in software updates that we release every few months. CJ, you want to fly us out? Yeah, I mean, this is just a really exciting conversation. Brendan, thanks so much for, for being here, um, kind of taking us under the hood of, of Skydio. And, and um, you know, just real quick, um, what's top of mind for uh, 2021 as we move into the next year? Anything exciting in the roadmap? Yeah, very quickly, we're going to capitalize on software to solve really challenging business problems. I mentioned 3D scan. Um, look for that in a neighborhood near, near you um, mm -hmm. and at your job sites. Uh, we're already starting to, to show that, and I can't say too much. There is a page on our website, but you're going to see that really shake things up in the industry and make drones a lot more useful to a lot more people uh, because the drone is, again, more trustworthy and able to Com complete com complex task on its own. And that's really the secret to making the industry scale. All right. Yeah. And I think, I think we can all agree. We'd, we want to see this industry scale, create something sustainable, something effective, um, and, and just c cut costs, you know, increase safety and, and create value all around. So, um, yeah, Brenda, thanks again for, for being here, staying a few minutes late with us. Um, if anybody wants to uh, meet Brendan virtually, you can hear him speak at Interdrone Online, December 15th through 17th. Um, if you're watching this podcast on YouTube, please hit subscribe. Um, we, we do this every week, so uh, stay up to date on the latest episodes there. Uh, Brendan's colleagues at Skydio will be hosting a webinar with us at Interdrone next week. Uh, it'll be next Thursday, November 19th. Um, I'll put a link in the description of this podcast. If you're watching the podcast, you can see the, um, the graphic rotating in the, in the bottom right uh, quadrant there. And then lastly, definitely go check out Launchpad. I know we rolled the ad midway through this recording. Um, Mike and I are really excited to bring you this new resource and, uh, and help connect and educate the industry. So thanks again for, for tuning in, everybody. This will be on Spotify, uh, Apple Music, SoundCloud, wherever pods are casted. So we will see everybody next week.